church. Good morning, church. His grace is amazing. He is a powerful God, and we're so glad to honor him this morning. It's communion Sunday, so if you're watching online, I encourage you to go get your, your elements, your juice, your wine, and your bread. We're going to share in communion later on in the service, but for us right here, right now, I want you to just close your eyes for a minute and has God ever extended his grace to you? Absolutely. Grace, given us what we didn't deserve. Mercy, not given us what we did deserve. He's that kind of God. And he is worthy of our praise. We bless you, Lord, because we understand what a great sacrifice you made. And we're grateful for that. And we want to honor you this morning raise the name and the power of Jesus Christ over this service, over our lives, and we love you, God. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy is the King
I know we don't do this much anymore, but would you get six feet away from someone and welcome them and greet them in the name of the Lord? sing that third verse again because I believe that God wants to release a healing powerful flow of his spirit this morning we need his hope and his healing his strength and his love and that happens when the Holy Spirit is free to work in our hearts is he free to work in your heart this morning say Lord I open up my heart to you release your love inside of me unleash your power
faithful and we give you thanks we love you God we used to sing a song a long time ago Jehovah Jireh my provider Jehovah Jireh my provider his grace is sufficient for me his grace is sufficient for you and I but I found a new wellspring in thinking about God, my provider. He provides uh, everything we need for life and godliness, the word says. But I have, I'm growing in this. I'm not there, but I'm growing in this thought. He's provided complete acceptance for me and you. He absolutely accepts us just the way we are. Everything I need is in him. I'm growing in this because sometimes I think I need more money, more time, more weight loss. Am I the only one? <laughs> no. I'm learning he's enough. And that when I step into his acceptance and his love, I can walk in that enoughness and know that I am whole. sing that again because some of you don't know what it's like to have your daddy say I don't need you to win an award I don't need you to clean up your room perfectly every time I love you just the way you are I'll never be more loved than I am right now wasn't holding you up so there's nothing I can do to let you doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Jaira, Jaira, you are I know what you've spoken. I'm already loved more than I could imagine. And that is enough. Help me sing. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I know who I am. 
seated. We are here in the presence of the Lord. It's Communion Sunday. We're going to partake of this holy sacrament. Those of you that are watching online, grab some grape juice or wine and bread, and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. I count it as joy, an opportunity, <clears throat> a true ministry from heaven where God's Holy Spirit just literally reaches down into our hearts and minds, and he changes us, he transforms us, he brings healings because we acknowledge what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread 
and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. There's a final condemnation that's coming on the entire world. And God says there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Everyone say amen. amen. So here's the good news. God one day is going to punish all the evildoers. God one day is going to punish all those who do wrong. But the good news is that everyone who accepts Christ, everyone who says yes to God, are saved. Now some of you might say, well, Pastor David, there are some who have other religious perspectives, other religious faiths. What about them? And Jesus makes this wonderful statement in Scripture, says, I have sheep that you do not know of, sheep in another fold. And so I believe that Jesus is going to bring people from all over the world, other religious perspective, other religious faith, and is going to lead them to the truth of his Son. Hear me carefully, not talking about universalism, but talking clearly about the fact that people everywhere are going to realize that Jesus is the Son of God. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son. And Jesus is the representation of God. So our prayer for all my brothers and other faith perspectives and people that don't have a faith perspective is that they would come to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And many, many are doing that. Many are acknowledging that. So as we pause for this moment to recognize that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of all humanity, let's bow our heads. Because the scripture says for us to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. Is there any sin in your heart? Is there any sin in my heart that I need to ask God for forgiveness for? Anything that I've done wrong over the last several weeks? If you are here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus or you're listening online and you've never said yes to Jesus, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Say, say this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died on a cross for me. I turn away from my sin and I embrace you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. You know, that's a good prayer for a Christian even to say because today we're saying yes to God as we're examining our hearts. So as I pause, ask God to forgive you of your sin. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you forgave me of my sin that you forgive me of all the things that I do wrong, that at times I've been messed up doing things that are not pleasing you, and you've forgiven me. I thank you for your forgiveness this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So notice in the scripture says he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus allowed his body, his body to be broken for you? Open up your cups this morning. Flip up the top lip of the cups that you got when you came in this morning. Partake of the bread of the Lord. Let's eat together. As we eat the bread, we take in the body of Christ in our lives. We appropriate. Just as the bread goes down our esophagus, our throats, into the systems of our body, we are allowing Jesus to penetrate every area of our hearts. The life of Jesus, his Holy Spirit, is penetrating my mind, and it's helping me to love people better, helping me to love God better. We partake of the body of Christ. His Spirit is in us, healing us, leading us, and guiding us. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for us. And then the cup, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink together.
Father, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your body shed for us. the church of the Lord this morning, the house of God. Everybody say amen. Amen. I sense the healing presence of the Lord in this place. God is moving mightily. Today is a wonderful Sunday to experience God's presence. We've had communion. We've had great worship. Give a hand clap for the worship team in Deborah. Thank you. Wow. Wow. We thank them because they have served us and they've helped us to enter into the presence of the Lord, which is a good thing. Well, today is a great Sunday. We were supposed to deliver a sermon last Sunday, but I couldn't do it because the doctors cut on Pastor David. I had surgery. They cut on me. They digged into my side, and they took out my adrenal gland. And so I'm one less gland this morning, one less gland. Every human body has two adrenal glands. You can live on one. So they took out my adrenal gland. Everyone says, Pastor, what's an adrenal gland? Well, an adrenal gland is that an organ that God puts in our bodies that helps to register your blood pressure, your hormone systems in your body. And I've been on blood pressure medicine, blood pressure medicine for years, and the doctor said, you know what, you have this high blood pressure problem that's been persistent. I wonder if you have a bad adrenal gland. And sure enough, they did this test, extensive test. They poked me in my side and got a piece of the adrenal gland out, and they said, yep, it's defective, got to go. So they said, you know, we can control this with medicine. So for the last year, I've been controlling the medicine. But he said, long term, if you get it taken out, you decrease your potential for strokes. I said, take it out. <laughs> so, so I had to take it out, and uh, surgery was very successful. Beginning of surgery, had a few problems. High blood pressure went up. See, I had the high blood pressure problem. They had to give me some medication to bring it down. Had a problem with the tube being innervated. They got that all resolved. And then the surgery itself was an hour. So God brought me through. And here's the good news. Since I've had the surgery, I have not had to use any high blood pressure medicine. All my readings are low. So I went. Now, now let me tell you how Pastor David works, and I encourage you to do the same. Don't go off and be your own doctor. 
I went to my doctor on Friday, gave him my readings for the whole week, and he says, yep, those readings are low. You don't have to take that medicine. I said, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Well, this morning, we're talking about a very difficult subject, a difficult subject because statistically, some in our congregation and some in the community have experienced this. We're talking about the subject of sexual abuse. And it's a subject we're going to deal with out of 2 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to look at some scriptures. But before I read the scripture, I just want to let you know that this is an incident that happened in the Bible. It's an incident that's spoken of in Holy Writ so we can learn from it, so we can be healed by it. I thought it would be very appropriate. I had a discussion with the leaders of our church, our elders, our church council, informed them I would be talking about the subject. They've been praying about it. And so they suggested, one of our council members suggested that, you know, Pastor, it might be good to have a person speak, a woman in particular, speak briefly about this subject. And so I've asked Sandra Porter to come forward at this time, and she's just going to give a short word on how this has impacted her and any thoughts that God lays on her heart. Would you give Sandra a hearty amen as she comes? Just keep speaking, it'll, it'll come Okay. Up. There it is, it's on. All right, so let me just start by saying, you know, we serve a great God and that uh, he brings you through whatever you're going through. And so um, you know, this is a difficult subject for lots of people. Um, I'm sure there have been lots of people who may have been violated in a particular way um, that's just not good. And I have been violated in that way. But, um, I mean, I don't need to go into any details or anything, but God has brought me through. And it's something that I haven't thought about for a really long time. And when a uh, pastor asked me to talk about it, I said, no, I don't have a problem with that. But, um, you know, I mean, this is something that my kids don't know. When I was married, my husband didn't know. Because sometimes what you do is you suppress those things and you put them in the back of your mind and you just hope and pray that you can get through whatever the trauma was. Because it's in the past. And I don't have to live that life. I don't have to live with that thought. So I am so grateful to God that he has brought me through and that I was able to move on because it was something that happened long before I was married and long before I had children. So, um, yeah, it happens. And the thing that happens is that lots of times it happens when it's someone that you know. So in the story, in, this, in, the, in the Bible, we know that it was Tamar's brother, but that wasn't the case for me. <laughs> but I could recall um, growing up, my uncle did a sermon about the same thing that we're talking about today. And I remember saying to my son, you never touch your sister that way and you never treat any females that way. So it's all, it's, Maybe it's, you know, sometimes it's in the back of my mind, but it always stays in the forefront as well because it's something that you'll never, ever forget. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Support. Give her a hand clap. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn to first, excuse me, second Samuel chapter 13. I'm going to read it. You can stay seated. I'm going to read this passage of scripture, second Samuel chapter 13. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Let me just explain that David had several wives, and that day polygamy was allowed, and so David had several wives, and so he had uh, these uh, two different children, uh, Amnon and Tamar, by different wives, and so they were technically stepbrothers and sisters. Verse 2, Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now, Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, 
son of Shimei, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do, you, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? What about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her and with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had ever loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and he said, get this woman out of my sight. And he bolted the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing, a, <clears throat> she was wearing an ornate robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put on ashes on her head, tore the ornate robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all of this, he was furious. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon. Either good or bad, he hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep bearers were at Bel Hazor near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come to him. Absalom went to the king and said, Your servant has had shears come. Will the king as attendants please join me? No, my son, the king replied. All of us should not go. We only would be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, if not, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The king asked him, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent him Amnon and the rest of the king's sons. Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is high in spirits from drinking wine, I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So, Am so Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom ordered. Then all the, king sat up, all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. So here we see <clears throat> in this very, very descriptive story what happened to this woman Tamar. She was violated. She was abused by her brother. And as a result, there was a consequence to what he did to his sister. And the consequence came from the hands of his brother, and Amnon was killed. This created a great division in the kingdom that David had and in the sons. And there was violence throughout David's life for the rest of his life. There was something that King David didn't do, and I'll get to that in a minute which is very important as we talk about this subject of sexual abuse. We're talking about this subject of sexual abuse this morning because we in the Church of Christ want to make ourselves aware that it has happened, it happens in the world, it happens in the church. 
I know of situations of four churches that I've attended throughout my life, one in, Se um, one in Seattle, one in New York, and now two here in the Northwest. And throughout all my four church experiences throughout my life, I've heard about and seen situations that have happened either in the church or people nearly connected to the church where this awful deed has happened. I did Words of Life this week. Words of Life are just a little short paragraph that Pastor David gives to you, the members, and I send it out to the community uh, openly to anyone that wants to read it. And in the Words of Life I sent out this week, I said, stand up and speak out. And in the Words of Life this week, I talked about a story of a situation that happened in a church in Seattle that I was attending. It was a young woman who was in our youth group, and I happened to be one of the youth leaders at that church, taught Sunday school, and she was even in my Sunday school class and had the opportunity to, te to teach her and minister God's grace to her. And as she got older, after she left the church, got older, got married, she married a man who became and was an abusive husband. I didn't know the full extent of the abuse that he was doing to her, but I found out later that it was an abusive husband. This young woman in our church was the uh, daughter of two of, our, uh, two, of, uh, of two of our leaders in our church. The one gentleman was, a, was actually an elder, a trustee, a deacon in our church. And Deborah, I don't know if you remember who it was, but Deborah and I went to the church up in Seattle. And they were the nicest people, but long story short, this daughter of theirs married this man, had four children, and the man ended up killing her. It was a story in the front page of the Seattle Times, and when I saw it, my heart just grieved. And I had heard about that there was some abuse going on, but she had left the church years later. I didn't really have a close connection to her. And I had heard about it through her parents that this man was abusive, and in my small little world of just living and doing my thing, didn't have a real connection to her, so didn't feel compelled at that point to really go to the mother and father and say, and I've heard that your daughter's being abused. What can we do? Can you do something to get her out of that situation? Didn't do anything, didn't make any conversation. She was killed. I vowed ever since that happened, I will never, ever be silent. And anytime I become aware of abuse happening, particularly to women, it happens to men, it happens to boys also, and any time that I'm aware of it, I vow that I will never not be silent, and I will do everything in my power to do what I can. And so in this subject that we're talking about this morning, the same thing applies. If abuse is going on in the church of God, if abuse is going on in the community, and I know about it, I'm gonna take every step in my power. The first thing I'm gonna do is to affirm and to tell women that have had this happen to them that it is not your fault. You do not have to bear any shame. Chris, I'm gonna ask you to put up the slide on the resources. I put a slide up to give resources that if you know someone or if you yourself have experienced this, there's a National Sexual Assault Hotline. One of our members have actually manned this hotline and uh, knows about it, and so we're recommending to you to refer on as a resource to people who have experienced this, that here's a place that they can go to process it and get help and get healing. You can even say when you call the line that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and do you mind if you start the, the session out with prayer, and they will acknowledge that and allow you to pray, but it's a good resource to help you process and to walk in healing and or you can get other resources and counseling to help you walk through this situation. But the thing I wanna say over and over again to you today, to the women and or possibly men who have had this happen to them, that if this has happened to you, you are not at fault. The Bible says that Jesus wept with Mary and Martha and Jesus weeps with you if you've gone through this. Jesus is certainly concerned about your healing, certainly concerned about you as you go through these things. And so today, the title of our sermon, now you can bring out the other slide, Chris, which is the title of the sermon. Today we're gonna to be talking about what can we do to create an environment for healing and accountability for sexual abuse? What can we do to create an environment for healing and accountability? through sexual abuse. So there's four ideas that I want to share with you. And the first idea is remain in an environment of good counsel. Remain in an environment of good counsel. Now, story today, Amnon had counsel from a shrewd guy who was telling him to do the wrong thing. You know, there's a, there's, there's a thing that 
talks about you hanging out with people and certain types of influences in your life. And as you and I allow influences in our lives and people in our lives who are unhealthy, who give us bad counsel, who say to you at the first, uh, first draw of anything bad happening in your life, oh, let's just go get wasted. Let's go get plastered. Let's go get drunk. Let's not go to church. Let's just go do something. Let's go to the casino. Let's uh, just deep our heads in pleasure and just forget about everything. And if you have friends like that who are encouraging you to go down that path, that's a friend that you want to stay away from, particularly when you have a time of vulnerability. So don't associate or frequent yourselves with unwise counselors. And so the question that needs to be asked is, who are you listening to? Are you allowing yourself to be around someone who gives you excessively bad or poor counsel? Remember that as you and I associate with certain kinds of people, that they eventually may affect us and affect the decisions that we make. And point number two, it leads, point number one leads to point number two. And point number two is surround yourself with godly people that will speak truth to you when you have bad thoughts. Surround yourself with people that will speak truth to you when you have bad thoughts. Verse 3 says, Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, David's brother, uh, who was the son of David's brother, who was very shrewd. He wasn't a wise counselor. This person was speaking things to him that was just totally wrong, totally messed up. When you and I surround ourselves with godly people that will speak truth to you, when you have those bad ideas, you can turn your bad thoughts over to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he can help you to handle your desires and your shortcomings. You can ask God to keep you from sinning. Let's turn to a scripture in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians that talks about the temptations that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And this is what it says. No temptation has overtaken you except that what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When we're tempted by things that come into our lives, God comes to us with supernatural power, and he helps us to counteract the temptations of our evil desires. You know, some of the things I've said to people at times in the church of God is that sometimes we do bad things as Christians. Sometimes we are evil. Sometimes we are wrong. Sometimes we are stubborn. And one of the members in my church once said to me one time, she goes, Pastor, I didn't like it that Sunday when you said that we're evil. She goes, I'm not evil. And I said, yes, you are. <laughs> You're telling me a lie right now. <laughs> so we have to admit that as Christians, we do and say bad things. We have to admit as Christians, we come uh, front and center to the things that come into our minds, our thoughts, and our hearts, and we have to acknowledge that those things are sinful. We have to acknowledge that those things are not godly. We have to acknowledge. And when we acknowledge it, and then here's the key. Turn it over to the Lord. The old Andre Crouch song, turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus. When we turn it over to Jesus, he will make it right. But the key is when we hide it, here we go. We have a bad thought that comes from our mouth. We hide it. We cover it up. We put a blanket over it. You know, just like I have this little, you know, back in the day, they used to have people putting covers over there. You, you just cover up that sin. And nobody can see your eyes. You just hide that sin. You don't tell your best friend. We had a leadership meeting yesterday, a leadership meeting of the leaders of Tiger Covenant Church. And we were praying for you. We we're praying for what God wants to do through this church the next year. And so I asked our leaders, and I want to ask you the same question. I asked our leaders to get another person in your life, to get just one other person in your life where when you sin or you're tempted to sin, and something comes across your mind, your thought process, or some urge or desire you have that's not ungodly, and that's not, God, that's not godly, that you would go to your Christian brother or sister, and you would say, will you pray for me? I have three other pastor friends who I call upon to do just that. I have the elders in our church who I call upon. That's Deborah, Brother Alvin, Brother Chuck, who I call upon, and I meet with them weekly. And sometimes when we have our weekly meetings, I say to my brother elder, I said, I don't really feel good. I'm mad about this. I said, pray for me. I said, I had a situation come up. I'm just being vulnerable this morning. I had a situation that come up. This is something I said to him not too long ago. I said, I had a situation that came up in my life, and I started cussing. 
And I said, I had to ask God to forgive me of using bad language. And they prayed for me, they prayed for me, and you prayed for me, and I prayed for you. And when God's Spirit comes upon me, guess what happens? When I was cussing at one time, because I confessed it to my brothers and sisters, and they pray for me, Pastor, we realize that God wants to use you and let holy language come out of your life when the next opportunity comes for me to cuss. And the issue that I get most upset about is people driving in front of me on the roads, <laughs> cutting me off and causing me to have an accident, and so choice words would come out of my mouth. And so now what I do instead of cussing as I say, Lord, bless them. I say, Lord, they're having a bad day. So I turn the cussing problem into a strength problem because I confessed it to God, I confessed it to the elders, and I'm walking in healing and in wholeness of that situation. All of you have something in your life that you need to confess. And when we create an environment of accountability, we are the church that will help to see the evil that's in the world be diminished and decreased. Now, at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you a great a verse of Scripture that's really going to get to the root of how do we deal with the evil that's in our heart at times? How do we deal with the sin that creeps up on us at times? How do we deal with this interaction of humans one-on-one? -on -one? How do we deal with it so that we have wholesome, healthy relationships in John 8, 12, we're going to get to the end of the sermon and share that scripture because that's the real solution for what we're talking about today. But it starts with you admitting that you need help, admitting that you need another brother or sister to go with you and help you as you go through life's problems. Tuesday night Bible study is another opportunity for you to be around other Christians. Our Tuesday night Bible study, we have such a great time. Not only do we read the Bible, it's a time of prayer. We pray for each other. Sometimes when one of us has a problem, we pray for each other. And as we pray for each other, good things happen because we are associating with other believers and healing occurs. Let the church say amen. amen. Point number three, men are called upon to love women, not harm them. Men in particular are called upon to love women, not harm them. Men must not use their strength in ungodly ways. Men must come to a place of humility and openness so that as men, we can liberate, free, empower, sponsor, and care for our, brother, for our fellow sisters in the body of Christ and care for women in the world and in our larger community because we're men of grace. We don't see women as objects. We see, that them, we see them as daughters that God has made whom we should and we must respect. One of our leaders, getting back to our leadership meeting yesterday, and thank you, woman leader, I won't mention your name. One of our women leaders in our meeting yesterday asked me, asked me a direct question. And I thought it was a rhetorical question. So I said, do you want an answer from me? Or do you want to give me some suggestions? Because I'm always wanting to learn from one another. And I want to learn from women. I want to learn from men. I want to put my place. Yes, God has placed me in a position of pastor, and that is a position of authority. But he has called me to be a servant leader. And so I want to learn from women when they speak to me. I want to learn from men when they speak to me. I don't have all the answers. And so in our meeting yesterday, one of our women leaders asked me, Pastor, what are you doing in our church to protect women? What are you doing? And so I said, we've had three incidences in this church where people came to me at different parts, excuse me, at different points in time and said, Pastor, I feel like I am being sexually harassed. I am being sexually taken advantage of by a male in this church. And in those three instances, I directly went to the man and told him to stop. And in those three instances, it only happened three times in 17-year tenure at this church. And in those three times, I told the man to stop. He didn't stop. I took another leader of our church with me, an elder, and we went to the man and we told him to stop. He didn't stop. And so I went to that man and I said, you've got to go. And that man was removed from this church. So what am I going to do? I'm going to stand up for injustice. 
Now, we have an environment in this church of learning, of vulnerability. We have a dynamite men's group where our men's group is led by Brother Alvin, and I assist him in leading our men's group. We have a dynamite Tuesday night group. And as men, we have opportunities to learn from each other. The scripture says iron sharpens iron. So we do everything we can on a preventative level to minister God's grace to men, to help them so they don't get to that point when Pastor David has to come to you. Now, that was three times where we had to put people out of the church. But let me tell you that there were hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of times over the last 17 years where I've spoken to men about various issues and they repented and they stopped. Isn't that a great story? So, but we only think about the three, but the truth is there's been hundreds who I've spoken to over the years who have stopped their behavior. Once Pastor David or another man brings something to our attention, the men have stopped and the men have changed their behavior. This is the kind of church we want to create where men are sharpening men, women are sharpening women, women have issues too they need to deal with. But as we have this openness with each other, we create an environment of accountability. Let the church say amen. Now, the fourth point that I want to speak to you on, which is probably the most important point today, we must, number four, speak out against sexual abuse anywhere it occurs. We must not be silent. Look at our text today in 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 21. When King David heard about all this, he was furious. That's where it stopped. David got upset, David got mad, David King David got angry, but he did nothing about it. He caused no consequence to be exacted upon his son who had done this evil deed. He turned his back on when that happens. And I'm asking all of us as a church to stand up, to speak out. Like I told you that story about that young lady in my church in Seattle, we must speak out when we hear of abuse. We must speak out when things are not going right. We must stand up for people that are being taken advantage of. And when we do that, we create an environment of health. We create an environment of healing. We create an environment of love. Speak out. We must hold people accountable. We must stand up to, we must lift up a standard of respect and mutual accountability. We must say no to harassment. We must believe that God's Holy Spirit is within us. We took Holy Communion this morning. And what did we say in communion? We said, Lord Jesus, ex uh, we asked you to examine yourselves. And we said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, cleanse my heart, clean me up change me, heal my mind. And that's another way that we create a healthy environment as a, as a church of Jesus Christ. Let the church say amen. amen. Let's go to John, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 13, verse 12, rather. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the root core solution to the evils of the human heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The core solution of the human endeavor, the human condition, the human plight where people do wrong things, the human uh, experience where people don't treat people right, where men don't treat women right at times. Women don't treat women right at times. At times, parents don't treat their children right at times. Children don't treat their parents right at times. What is the cure for the human heart that has gone bad? Now, notice what this verse says. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So Jesus is the light. He is the physical light. The book of Revelation tells us that one day when we get to heaven, it's going to be a glorious time, that there will be no need of a physical sun because Jesus will be so brightly lit that he is going to light up the whole room literally. So he physically is the light and he spiritually is the light. Jesus comes in a way that puts a light on our human condition and it helps to cure us, it helps to heal us. Now notice that Jesus says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness because there's darkness, there's wickedness, there's evil all around the world. This awful deed that happened to Tamar and our story, it's a wicked thing, it's a bad thing, it should never happen. So is Jesus saying that you'll never commit sin if you have him in your life? Is Jesus saying you're never going to stumble? No, what he's saying that 
you will not walk in darkness. You will never walk in darkness. He didn't say you would never sin, but you would never walk in darkness. Well, pastor, what's the solution? What's the key to walking in less darkness and walking in more light? Notice what Jesus says, but you will have the light of life. That if you ask Jesus on a daily basis, if you and I ask Jesus on a daily basis, say, Lord Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you on a daily basis open up the Word of God and read his word, Jesus said, my words are life. And if you read his word and you speak to Jesus and ask his light to shine upon your heart on a daily basis, when you come encounter with a bad thought, when you come encounter with a situation that wants to make you rise up and cuss, like I said, I did at one time, you will then allow that light to counteract that temptation, to counteract that stubborn spirit, to counteract. And all of us has issues in our lives that like a dentist goes into your mouth and works on the tooth and gets out the cavity, the Holy Spirit will go into the deep crevices of your heart and your mind and help you to be counteracting your sinful conditions because you say yes to God. So I want you this morning to say yes, Lord Jesus. Everybody say it. Say yes, Lord Jesus. Yes to your life. And when the light of Jesus shines in your heart, when those thoughts come into your mind, you are prevented, you are stopped from moving down that path of unrighteousness. And the more time you spend with Jesus, the more time you're going to walk in holiness and righteousness. It's no accident that when we come together and pray, it's no accident when our church leadership team came together and we spent three hours together and we started out in prayer, we're going to start loving each other more because we spent time together. When you come together into our men's uh, Bible study, women, you come together in the women's Bible study, and many of you in the rooted class experience, and you come together in that experience, or you come together with that one-over person I told you to have. Everybody needs a one-over person that you need to have somebody that you can have some prayer with and have a confessional time where you can talk to another person, you are moving in the light of Jesus and it affects the quality of your life and we are creating an environment of healing. And those who have had this awful situation after them, happen to them, we can create an environment of healing for our brothers and sisters who've experienced this and they can walk in grace. Let the church say amen. John 18, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Deborah and worship team, can you come forward? Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Here's another scripture that will help us create an environment of healing in our church. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, this is the shoe leather of walking in the way of love. You can't tell me you're walking in the way of love and then abusing your brother or sister. You can't tell me you're walking in the way of love and hating someone because they're of another race or hating someone because they have another political party, or hating someone because they are a different economic condition, or hating someone because they came from a different part of the country geographically, or hating someone because they come from another country. But when we have love abounding in our hearts because the light of life, Jesus, is shining in our hearts, we have an environment of love, and we mitigate, we reduce the potential for these awful evils to occur in the church and in the community. And what happens in the church house spills out over into the community because you are the church and you take the church with you, you take Jesus with you into your neighborhood. And so you're going to love your neighbor. And so let love abound. Speak up for unrighteousness and allow God's Holy Spirit to come to you. I've asked several of our leaders to stand with me this morning. So our leaders that I asked to come forward, I asked some of our women leaders to come forward. So let's all stand together. We're going to sing a song. If you need special prayer, this is going to be a time of prayer. Maybe you need to pray for someone that has been abused or pray for someone who's hurting or pray for someone who's sick. So you leaders, come stand here in the forward. And just ask some of our leaders to pray with you. Sometimes it's good to have a person to connect with. So they're going to pray for you, and as Deborah sings this song, let's just come forward, have a time at the altar, a time of prayer, where we allow God's Holy Presence to heal our hearts. Lead us, Deborah. I wrote this song about 20 years ago. 
because I had experienced the violation pastor spoke of as well. And God is a healer. I tried to do as Sandra described, just push it in the back of my brain. But one day, the Holy Spirit visited me in my office and began a healing. And I would encourage you as I sing this that if you need a healing in your heart today, would you come forward and let these women and men of faith agree with you that God is the healer.
Let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. That's a very tough subject matter there. And uh, we think that we have a pastor that is able to uh, tackle that. So, again, let the church say amen. Amen. I want to welcome our guests again today. If you're visiting with us in person or online, just know you're welcome here at Tiger Covenant Church. If you have any questions, please see one of us at the service. Or if you're visiting online, you can give us a call at our church office. We love to talk to you. Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, we're going to do a Thanksgiving dinner Tuesday, November 16th at 6 p.m. Joni. Joni going to be putting that on her. Her, uh, her son is a chef. And he's going to come, and they're going to do an amazing job of cooking. And, and George, he's going to be helping also. So love to have you guys out. Put that in your calendar. Our annual all-church business meeting, Sunday, December 12th. So again, put that in your calendar. Uh, we would uh, hopefully that uh, all of our church members will attend that. Christmas Eve, Eve, I'm sorry, Christmas event, Christmas Coffee House, December 4th. Tickets are on sale now. Are they on sale now? Deborah has the ticket, so if you need a ticket, see Deborah. There are tables that you can purchase, so you might want to purchase a table. And then also our Christmas concert, December the 19th. Um, so please put those dates in your calendar. Uh, jo Joni, you want to come up and tell them about the food that's out there? Good morning. Um, first, talking about the Thanksgiving dinner, um, we do need volunteers. So if you're able to help, we really would appreciate it. And we need people to set up tables and chairs, set the tables, serve the food, prepare to-go boxes, clean the tables afterwards um, and put away, clean pots and pans, mop the floor and sanitize the countertops, um, and take out the garbage. So. If anybody can volunteer and help, we really appreciate your help because it's a really wonderful thing for the community and all of us to come together. Um, and about the food out there, um, we also do the community, um, the food pantry on Tuesdays. And uh, through the Oregon Food Bank, they uh, contacted Tiger Covenant Church about um, uh, picking up groceries at Trader Joe's on Saturdays. So George and I uh, picked up this week, and we also volunteered to pick up on um, Friday because somebody couldn't do it. We were totally overwhelmed about how much food that they were giving us to give out to people. So to this morning, we would love it if everybody, uh, there's grocery bags out there. We have boxes if anybody wants boxes of food or boxes to put their food in. Um, take as much food as you'd like. And George and I will be bringing out more refrigerated things and some frozen stuff. But it's wonderful food, and if you need it or want it or whatever, please help yourself because it's a lot. And we'll be picking up every Saturday. So um, as much as you want because there's plenty. It, um, this is just a sampling out here of what we have. We have a lot of stuff. So bringing that to mind we have um the food pantry whoops the food pantry on um on tuesdays and esmeralda leads that and um, we need uh, people to help with the food um, distribution in the community on tuesdays from nine until noon um, we also need people to help clean up afterwards from like 11.30 to 12.30 to help get everything all cleaned up. <laughs> um, also, since we're doing the Saturday pickup for the food pantry, we do need people, if you have a truck or a van, to be able to pick up uh, food at Trader Joe's um, on Saturdays around 10 o'clock. It's on Greenberg and Olson Road as it intersects. It's a brand new Trader Joe's and they just have over-ordered it. They haven't quite gotten it figured out yet, so, <laughs> which benefits us. Um, and then, uh, then at 11 here, we need people to unload, weigh the food, put the food away for the pantry. Um, so we need that. And community dinners. We always need help to, for community dinners. We need cooks especially. Um, and the more people that volunteer to cook, 
then uh, the less often you have to do it. So the more volunteers, it um, helps with everybody. So we also need people to um, uh, set up for the community dinners like at 530 and to take down and clean up afterwards. So we're usually done like 7.15, 7.30 at the latest. So anyway, if anybody can do that, um, my name is Joni. Um, you can get, I guess, I don't, anyway, you can just, okay, all right, yeah, thank you very we'll, much. We'll, we'll point you to Joni if uh, you want to volunteer. Thank you, Joni, so much. Um, this is our opportunity. We always talk about being Jesus' hands and feet. I know a lot of times we want to be his mouth, but we need to be his hands and feet. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We need volunteers. Uh, November 11th, this Thursday, is Veterans Day. Do we have any veterans in the house? Let's give the veterans a hand. Well, we're going to let the veterans sit down. We normally tell the veterans to stand up. Veterans, sit down. Take, take a load off your feet for a minute. You're a veteran. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to say thank you. I've served also for 10 years in the Air Force, so uh, I know the training and preparation and the sacrifice it takes. Uh, we want to thank the family members of veterans, those men and women that have uh, sacrificed uh, their lives even, that we can have the freedoms and liberties that we have in the United States of America. So let's get a veterans a hand again. And this is our benediction, and this is our prayer. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. We thank our veterans in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Have a great day. Go in peace.